Number one, if you're going to adopt continuous delivery or DevOps or Scrum or anything else, the first question to ask is, why? Why do you want to do it? What's the measurable business or customer outcome that you want to achieve in measurable terms? Number two, it may take you years to get to your destination. Find some way to get some part of that goal early and then keep iterating. A good place to start is continuous integration. I'll explain more about continuous integration later. People tend to focus on tools and um, reorganization of the company. That's not usually the problem. And finally, the way you implement continuous delivery or anything else is by creating a culture of continuous improvement. But that should be news to nobody in this room. So just to emphasize again, people ask about tools, about methodologies, about org structure. That's never the problem. It's culture and architecture. And I will talk a bit about both of those things. Why would you care about continuous delivery? The reason we started with continuous delivery, the way I started my journey, is because I didn't want to be doing deployments in the evenings and at weekends. If you have a team which does deployments so the evenings or weekends, put your hand up. OK, a few of you. So that's a sign that something is wrong, that something needs fixing. Um, and we fixed that problem on our team back in 2005. And it made a huge difference to our lives. And when people come up to me sometimes and say, we don't do deployments at the weekends and evenings anymore, that makes me really happy. However. These techniques and ideas, it turns out, have many other benefits. It makes it faster to get your idea to market because you can get feedback early and often and adjust and get the thing that works to market early. It also improves quality of your software and the stability of your systems. Once you have a way to work in small batches, you can make incremental development cheaper the big benefit of continuous delivery is to reduce the transaction cost of making change. And then you can make change much more frequently. Finally, continuous delivery makes customers happy because you deliver things that actually make them uh, better at what they do. And secondly, it makes your employees happier because they have much closer connection to their customers. So now we know why. I'm going to talk about what. Continuous delivery fundamentally is about making it possible to get all kinds of changes, whether that's defects, uh, fixes for defects, uh, features, configuration changes, experiments, into production safely and quickly in a sustainable way. We want to make deployments to production boring so that you can do them all the time at the push of a button. The deployment process should be boring. The release of the features should be exciting. But the technical process should be boring. What I see in many organizations that say they are practicing agile is something that uh, Dave West from Forrester calls water scrum fall. So this actually is the industry standard agile practice. And what happens is the organization decides to go agile. And then everybody goes to the two-day scrum training. And then they come back, and they're taking orders from management standing up instead of sitting down. <laughs> and that huge backlog of work we can't ever complete is now estimated and prioritized. And now we're agile. Hooray. Um, however, in terms of overall lead times to go from golf course to measurable customer outcome, changing this part in the middle doesn't necessarily make a big difference to overall lead time because maybe it still takes one third of the time when you have a new idea to do budgeting and estimation and detailed planning. And then down here, this team is working in iterations, but nothing gets released to users. You have to finish the release and then do integration and then testing. Finally, the thing gets thrown to IT operations to try and make it work. So changing this bit in the middle to agile, I mean, if this takes one year, maybe this making this agile reduces it by 5-10%, but not necessarily a lot. Who works in an organization 
that practices water scrumful, or maybe you have a friend who works in an organization like this. <laughs> okay. So the question is, can we do better? And the answer is, yes, we can do better. I'm going to show you a slide that I saw in 2011 that made my head explode. So this is from Amazon. This is their production environment. They are making changes to production on average every 11.6 seconds, up to 1,079 deployments per hour. On average, 10,000 boxes receiving those deployments, up to 30,000 boxes receiving those deployments. This is 2011. They're now about one order of magnitude faster. This is aggregated across all their production services. I want to point out two things about this. Number one, Amazon is regulated. They process a huge amount of credit card transactions. They have to follow PCI DSS. They're a publicly traded company. They have to follow Sarbanes-Oxley, so it's heavily regulated. Number two, they spent an enormous amount of money doing this. They had to re-architect all their systems for four years to achieve this. So this required a really substantial investment and a complete re-architecture of their systems. Why did they do it? Firstly, to scale. They had an architectural problem. Their database wouldn't scale. They bought the most expensive hardware they could, and it wasn't enough. But there was another benefit. Because they can deploy so fast, they can run experiments in production to test their new features. And now, Amazon tests all their new features by running experiments. The guy who ran their experimentation team has a lot of data from A-B tests. And he then went to work at Microsoft uh, and has even more data. And he wrote a paper. And he says, based on his data, evaluating well-designed and executed experiments designed to improve a key metric, only about one-third was successful at improving that key metric. So these were ideas that people thought were good ideas. Excuse me a minute. So what this means is, if you're not testing your ideas, probably two-thirds of those ideas will deliver zero or negative value to your business and your customers. If you're not testing those ideas to find out if they really work. People thought these were good ideas. Instead, what you're doing is following the highly paid person's opinion. This is for products where we have validated that the product is valuable, we're just testing the features. If you're doing something that's a new product, the probability that you get it right will be even lower. This is the biggest source in software delivery. The features that we build that have zero or negative value. So if you want to get to where Amazon is, there's fundamentally two paths. There's a paper from Sloan Review from a few years ago where they analyzed 504 different organizations and they looked at two things, IT spending and compound annual growth rate. And then they divided the population into four groups. This group here, 74%, had the baseline spending and 2% below the baseline in terms of growth rate. That's the maintenance zone. And then up here, you've got a group which has 6% lower spending than the baseline, 35% higher compound annual growth rate. There's two ways to go from here to here. You can pursue alignment first, alignment with the business. That gets you to this place where you're spending 13% more and you have 14% lower growth rate. Or you can pursue efficacy and performance first and that gets you lower cost and higher growth rate. So if you want to go from here to here, the lesson is pursue performance and efficacy first and then pursue alignment. Otherwise, it's like having a car. You want to drive the car fast but when you turn the steering wheel, it takes three seconds for the car to change direction. If you try to go fast, you'll crash. You have to increase the performance, and then you can change the direction quickly. What do we mean by performance? So for four years, I've been working on surveying all kinds of organizations. We have a huge amount of data, more than 20,000 respondents, all kinds of domains, to try and understand what makes high-performing companies. So the first thing we found is a way to define IT performance. These are the four metrics. 
Two of these are throughput metrics. Lead time for changes, time to go from version control to production, and then release frequency, how fast can we release? And then there's two stability metrics, time to restore service, when something goes wrong in production, how long does it take to fix it? And then change fail rate, when we push something to production, what percent of the time does it fail? And we have to roll back or emergency fix. The most interesting result for me is that high performers do better at both. We like to think there's a trade-off, that if you go fast, you'll break things. What we find is the high performers are not making a trade-off. They're changing the game. They're finding practices and principles that allow them to achieve higher throughput and higher stability. We also found that the practices of continuous delivery predict IT performance. So what are the practices and principles? Number one, building quality in. Again, no surprises for this audience. Number two, working in small batches, both in terms of product development and also in terms of process improvement. Number three, you want computers to do the repetitive tasks and humans to solve the problems. If you have computers, uh, sorry, if you have people doing, for example, manual regression testing, my colleague Neil Ford has a joke. All the computers are getting together late at night and laughing at you. <laughs> These are things that computers should be doing so that humans can focus on problem solving. And then, again, continuous improvement is how you implement this stuff. And finally, everyone is responsible. Testers are not responsible for quality. Developers are not responsible for throughput. Operations is not responsible for stability. Everyone is responsible for these system-level goals. Otherwise, people fight with each other rather than focusing on working together to solve the system-level problem. Continuous delivery has three foundations. Architecture, some patterns and practices, which are mainly XP, frankly, and then culture. And there's three key ingredients. Number one is configuration management. We should be able to reproduce the state of our production system purely from information in version control without any manual logging in and changing things. We should be able to get new developers or testers working on our team within one day without having to spend days setting them up and configuring their workstation and preparing the codes, all this kind of thing. And then two ingredients I'll spend a little bit of time on. Continuous integration and automated testing. And these ingredients all contribute to this idea of building quality in. We don't want to have downstream processes that validate that we did the right thing, that we built the thing right. We don't want to have mass inspection, you know, downstream QA to achieve quality. Instead, we build the quality in. So who here works on a team where you practice continuous integration? Anyone? OK. A couple of you. So I'm going to explain continuous integration because it's one of the key foundations of continuous delivery. So the way this starts is I'm working on my local machine. Uh, and my favorite paper on continuous integration, uh, continuous integration on a dollar a day, talks about how to do it with an old workstation and a rubber chicken and a bell. So it's very cheap. You can do it with one dollar. You don't need to buy tools. You don't need to do any expensive investment. It's a very cheap process. So I finish doing some work on my workstation. And I want to commit it to version control so that we can build the software and test it. So I'm going to run the build locally on my machine. I run the build and the tests. And because I'm pretty good, it passes. So then I'm going to walk over to the old workstation. And if the rubber chicken is not there, that means somebody else is checking in. So I wait for them to finish, and I take the rubber chicken. And I go back to my workstation, and I'm going to merge from trunk onto my machine from mainline. And I'm going to run the build and tests again, make sure that my changes haven't conflicted with anybody else's changes. Hopefully, other people have been working at the same time. So I'm going to test my changes merge correctly. And then I'm going to push them into trunk. And then I walk over to the old workstation, 
I check out from Trunk and I run the build and test on another machine that's not my machine because we all know that the works on my machine certification is not valuable, right? So if that passes, I can ring the bell, ding, I'm done, I did something cool, everybody else says, hey, well done, Jez. I put the rubber chicken down, somebody else can take it. If the build fails, I have maybe two, three minutes to go and try and fix the problem, maybe I forgot to check in a file. If I can't fix the build, what can I do? Yeah, revert. Take my change out of version control. One of the most selfish things you can do is leave broken code on trunk. So if it's 15 minutes before the end of the day, which is when everybody checks in, by the way, <laughs> and the build breaks, it's OK. Don't worry. Just revert your change, go home, get a good night's sleep, get up the next morning, try again. I worked on one team where we would delete the code from our working copy if we couldn't get it checked in. If we couldn't get it checked in, by the end of the day, we would just delete it. Then we'd have a good night's sleep, come in the next day. Almost always, we could solve the problem much more quickly with much better code after a good night's sleep. Most of the design work that you do as a developer happens when you're in the gym or in the shower or asleep, because uh, that's when your brain is doing your design work in a background thread. And this is why working long hours as a developer is a really bad idea. So this is the practice of continuous delivery. It doesn't require any tools. It doesn't require um, anything expensive. It's just a practice and a mindset. And crucially, in this practice, everybody is working off trunk. We're not working on feature branches that last more than one day. We're working in small increments on trunk. The rubber chicken does not scale. However, the practice and the mindset of continuous integration does scale. This is a slide from Google. They have more than 10,000 developers in 40 offices worldwide, more than 2,000 projects under development. They have a single code tree. Everyone develops and releases from head, from trunk. And all builds are done from source. So the practice of continuous integration scales. It does require a big investment in testing. And uh, it took Google several years to build up the suite of tests they needed to do this. They also invested in a big grid to run all their tests really, really quickly. Um, and it helps that Google has more servers than God. Uh, but they eventually developed a massive suite of tests in order to do their continuous integration builds. And that way, developers can get feedback within minutes if their code has broken anybody else's stuff. So this allows them to build quality in, to find any problems very quickly, uh, rather than going off in a branch and finding after several days' work that their code won't integrate. In order to build quality in, we need many different kinds of tests. We need unit tests that validate that the code behaves in the way the developers expect. This should all be automated. We also need manual tests, exploratory testing, usability testing, showcases. These are things you need human beings for. We're not removing manual testing in continuous delivery, but we do it all the time as part of development, not as a downstream process. We also have acceptance tests. These are end-to-end -end tests that run in a production-like environment to validate the system delivers the expected business value. We've had several people talk about these today. And then at the bottom right, we have non-functional tests for performance and security and so forth. Not all of these are automated, some are manual, but crucially, we run them from the beginning of the project because these are the tests that validate that the system has, the, uh, has an architecture that works. These are validating architecture. Architecture is defined by Martin Fowler as the, the bits that are hard to change. And so, you want to test those at the beginning, not at the end, when it's going to be hard and expensive to change your architecture. Once you have all these tests, you build a deployment pipeline, which is the key pattern in continuous delivery. And the idea here is that every time I make a change, I'm going to run some quick tests to make sure nothing bad happened. If they break, I'm going to fix them straight away. And then I'm going to trigger longer-running automated acceptance tests 
If those fail, we're going to fix them straight away. And then if those pass, we have a build which will go downstream to more expensive processes like uh, performance testing, exploratory testing, integration testing, and so forth. But every change to our system, we want to take as far as possible towards production and as quickly as possible. And we want to fix the problem straight away as soon as we can find them. So I'm going to give you a case study of a very large team who implemented this. This is the HP LaserJet firmware team. This is a team of 400 developers working in three countries, uh, Brazil and America and India. And this team had been on the critical path for new releases for many years. And they tried everything, hiring people, firing people, insourcing, outsourcing. And in the end, they were so desperate, they went to engineering management for help, which is how you know things are really bad. <laughs> and the engineering management did something interesting. They looked at activity accounting. How were they spending their money in terms of the activities they were doing? And what they found is they were spending 10% of their budget on code integration, 20% on detailed planning, 25% on porting code between branches. Every time they released a new family of printers, they would create a branch in version control. Then any bug fixes or features that were required by more than one family of printers, they would have to port the code across the branches. They were spending 25% of their budget doing this. 25% of their budget was spent on product support. What does this say? What does this tell us? Yeah, it's a quality problem. 15% of their budget was spent on manual testing. If you subtract that from 100%, you're left with 5%, which is the budget they were spending on actually building features. So it was very clear what they had to do. I mean, who has worked at a company where their manager tells them, there's no time for improvement work, we have to build the features? Right, and it becomes obvious what's going on. The reason you have the schedule pressure is because you're doing all this waste this non-value-add work. And the only way to fix it is to reduce the non-value-add work so that you can increase this. So the team had two goals. This was their true north. Number one, get firmware off the critical path. Number two, 10x increase in productivity measured in terms of innovation capacity, how much budget they were spending on features. They also looked at cycle time drivers, and it was taking them one week to get into trunk, they were getting one or two builds a day out of trunk, and it took six weeks to do a full manual regression. So with their true north, they decided to rebuild their platform from scratch with a few goals. They wanted to reduce hardware variation, so they would only use one chip. And once they reduced hardware variation, they only had one target, they could build a single package. That allowed them to implement continuous integration and a comprehensive test automation suite. And then they built a simulator so that developers could run the firmware tests on their desktops. Over two years, they developed a very sophisticated deployment pipeline. This was not what they started with. This was the result of two years of continuous improvement. They had a 400-person team working on a 10 million line code base after two years. Each of those developers would push a change into their own queue on Git, and then the CI system would build it and run two hours of automated tests. If those tests pass, those changes get batched up, and they run two hours of tests on the merged version. Only if those tests pass do the changes then go into trunk. It's the only way for the developers to get into trunk. So then the developers are going to work in small batches, Otherwise, the chances are their changes will not merge. So the system makes it so that the developers want to work in small batches. The system encourages the developers to do the right thing. Then they run two hours of automated tests against Trunk, another two hours using emulators, and then a complete regression suite every night. So using this system, 100 million lines of code, they got 100,000 lines of code change per day, 100 check-ins per day, 10 to 15 good builds per day, and they completely remove the regressions, the regressions um, part of the project. 
because they know the quality within one day and they fix it straight away. By making all these changes, they completely change the economics of the software delivery process. Code integration goes down from 10% to 2%. Detail planning goes down because they had an agreement with product marketing that they wouldn't spend so much time on the planning. Porting codes goes down from 25% to 15%. Product support goes down to 10%. What does this tell us? Higher quality. Manual testing goes from 15% to 5%. Budget spent on innovation goes from 5% to 40%, but there's something missing. What do you notice about the numbers on the right-hand side? It's not 100%. There's a new activity. They're spending 23% of their budget on maintaining and triaging and building the suites of automated tests. What would happen if you went to your manager and asked for 23% of your budget to spend on test automation? <laughs> And yet, they achieved their goal. The firmware was off the critical path. 8x improvement in resources driving innovation. So these are the economics. Development costs down 40%. Programs under development increased 140%. Development costs per program down 78%. Resources driving innovation increased by 8%. And by the way, higher quality at the same time. So they achieved faster time to market and higher quality and lower cost. This is the lean manufacturing story repeated for software engineering. So I'm out of time now, so I'm going to skip to the end. Uh, I just want to say that um, one of my favorite stories about lean is the Numi story. If you haven't heard the Numi story, go to This American Life uh, and read John Shook's article on how to change a culture. He says, the way we change culture is by changing what we do, the way we work in our daily, in our daily work. One way of doing this is through having the and on cord, being able to build quality in by stopping the line if we need to fix the problem. This idea actually goes back to the beginning of Toyota, the automatic loom, which instead of requiring people to look at the loom and watch for problems and then fix them, the machine would find the problems and stop it by itself, which changed the economics of this business. We have an analog of the and on cord, of the loom that detects problems in software. <coughs> that analog is continuous integration. As soon as we find a problem, the CI server tells us through the automated tests and we fix it straight away. And from the data we've gathered, we know that these practices here predict high levels of IT performance. They also impact culture. And we know that a culture of better information flow predicts higher IT performance. And both these things together predicts higher levels of organizational performance. I'm going to finish with a story from Amazon. So this is a story that was written up in 2006 by Greg Linden, who built the shopping cart for Amazon. Uh, he was working on, sorry, he was working on the recommendations engine for Amazon. And he had an idea. When you go to the store to buy your groceries, at the checkout aisle, they have chocolate, so that you buy the chocolate and they make some money. He thought, let's do this for Amazon. Let's give you recommendations, but personalized. You bought these things. Other people who bought those things also bought this. Would you like to buy this? So he made a prototype, showed the VP of product, and the VP of product said, no, don't do this, because people will abandon their cart. So Greg is a bit sad. The VP says no to his prototype. So he goes back to his desk, makes his prototype a bit better, pushes it into production, <laughs> gathers a bunch of data from A-B tests, which shows that actually Greg has a good idea, and it's going to substantially increase revenue goes back to the VP with the data and says, this is what I discovered. VP may be not happy, but doesn't fire Greg and tells him, we have to build this now. So Greg writes up this story. Who works at a company where, against the express order of a VP, you could push a change into production and gather data? And whether or not your idea was good, you would not get fired for doing that. Anyone? OK, a couple of you. That's cool. 
So Greg ends with this quote. I think building this culture is the key to innovation. Creativity must flow from everywhere. Whether you are summer intern or the CTO, any good idea must be able to seek an objective test, preferably a test that exposes the idea to real customers. Everyone must be able to experiment, learn, and iterate. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. First, thank you for your story. Um, uh, at the slide for IT performance, uh, mm -hmm. you showed some metrics. Yep. Um, I think I missed the metrics about um, uh, customer value. Yep. Is it on purpose or? Yeah, that's on purpose. So the reason is um, customer value we measure using organizational performance. Organizational performance is uh, profitability, market share, and productivity. But the reason I'm showing you this is because value for the customer is alignment. Are we actually building things that the customer wants? In this diagram, I'm saying that if you want to go from here to here, you have to pursue IT performance before you can pursue alignment. So doing this stuff is a precondition. Doing this stuff is a precondition to then being able to develop an experimental approach to product development where we can actually do experiments and get faster feedback from the customers. So before you can do that, you have to learn how to move fast and develop the quality and develop the stability. And only then can you actually focus on delivering the value. You can't deliver the value if it takes you so long to build anything that by the time you've built it, it's not useful anymore. Okay, thank you. I had the chance to discover Lin with uh, True Sensei shouting, uh, sh going to the game bar, doing problem solving the hard way. How did you do that? How did you, did you enter in the lean world? Uh, by accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> pretty much everything that happened in my life was an accident. Um, I ended up uh, working at ThoughtWorks, and I got put on a really horrible project um, where we were trying to build this software. Uh, it was a big team, 60 people developing software. It was they were developing on Windows laptops. It was going to get deployed to Solaris cluster. But it's Java, so it's platform independent. So that can't possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> so I was on a team of eight people who had to build that and deploy it to the Solaris cluster. And the first time we tried it, it took us two weeks, and it didn't work. And there was a lot of pressure for us to fix that problem. Uh, we had some automation, but it was in Ant. It was 8,000 8, lines of Ant script. We went to IT operations, say, said, do you like this? And they said, no, we hate it. Uh, you can't use it. And we said, well, what technology do you want? And they said, we want Bash. So we built them a deployment system in Bash. And over several months, we got the deployment process down to one hour. And we were able to do rollbacks and roll forwards in less than a second. But all that stuff was done with no technology. We used CVS and Bash. This was in 2005. There was no DevOps tools. Um, so it was, I mean, we were in this very difficult position and uh, the way we solved it, and it was people much smarter than me, uh, I just sat and learned from them. And the way we solved it is by talking to other people and by just incrementally looking at, you know, there's this two week process, how can we simplify it and automate it? And it took us three months to do it, but we just did it over time by trial and error. Um, and so that, that taught me most of the lessons that went into the continuous delivery book came from that project. So I would say, find nasty situations. Go looking for them. If you're feeling comfortable that you know what you're doing, that's a bad sign. Find something which makes you feel uncomfortable, where you're not sure that you can succeed, and try and solve those problems. Anytime I feel too comfortable that I know what I'm doing, 
I look for something which will make me feel uncomfortable. And then inevitably I learn lots of exciting things. I just worked in the US government where for two months I felt like I was an imposter. Uh, and I had to teach myself a load of stuff so I could feel like I knew what I was doing. Um, but my whole career has been like that, and that's what allowed me to learn. So sorry, that was a long <laughs>